Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this screening that is going to shine a spotlight on the wetlands of India. Thank you all for making time to be here today. Um, I'm especially delighted because I think that today's audience includes many students. Um, and I think that's very important to me because our focus today is not just going to be on getting to know wetlands better, but also how people who care, which I know is everyone who's here in the audience right now, how these people can make a vital difference. I am Neha Dara, and I am the business head of Rangla Sustain. We are a not-for-profit organization, and we tell stories to create awareness about India's natural world. Our stories are in a variety of mediums, and their goal is to help people realize their connection with the natural world. But everything we do, every single film, every photo story, every travel story, everything has a very, very strong basis in science. So what we're also doing with all this storytelling is creating an encyclopedia on India's wildlife and habitats. And when I say encyclopedia, it's not one of those old ones with the tiny text that one of you in the audience right now is probably using to prop up your laptop or your TV. But no, it's an encyclopedia for the modern world with a lot of rich media available online, it's digital, and it's free of cost for anybody to use. Now, one of the things we've realized uh, during our work at Rangla Sustain is that when we talk about wildlife and wild spaces, for most people, that always just means forests. So one of our goals is to always draw attention to lesser known habitats, like grasslands, like urban spaces, and like the wetlands we're talking about today. And as you saw in that slideshow, wetlands are among the most threatened. There's construction, there's dumping of debris and garbage. I mean, even converting of them into uh, plantations for farming, agriculture. And a lot of this just stems from a lack of awareness about the importance of wetlands. Our partners today in this effort are the Echo Network and WWF India. The ECHO Network is a unique social innovation partnership with a specific focus of increasing trust between sectors, increasing the value of science for society, and instilling a sense of responsibility in everyone for India's human and environmental ecosystems. They've brought together more than 1,300 people across countries throughout the world. WWF India is well known and for its commitment to creating and demonstrating practical solutions that help conserve India's ecosystems. They have over 50 years of a conservation journey in this country, and they work towards finding science-based sustainable solutions to address challenges that are at the interface of development and conservation. The WWF India office is one of 100 locations that WWF has worldwide. Now, our guide for today's screening is going to be my colleague, Divya Kandade. She's a writer, an anthropologist, a mountain climber, but more than anything else, she's someone with a deep and abiding love for the outdoors that I hope she'll share with everyone today. She's going to come on right after this first film, which is on the wetlands of Bharatpur, which are really well known. 
And you know that they host thousands of birds from around the world every winter. But even that is changing. Can you please play the film? In the plains of northern India lies the Kyoladeo Ghana National Park, also known as Bharatpur Bird Sanctuary. A dynamic, yet fragile ecosystem. A man-made park, it is a tiny 29 square kilometer area that shelters over 375 species of birds and several other wild creatures. Every winter, migratory birds travel here from across the world. The cackling calls and the mist give it an aura, unique to Bharatpur. The monsoon kicks off the magic. When it rains, Bharatpur transforms into a rich marshland and its lakes brim with fresh water. Pockets of the park turn into busy breeding colonies. Herons, storks, egrets, cormorants, spoonbills and ibis build nests and raise their young. Before the 18th century, Bharatpur witnessed floods every year. To avoid the deluge, Maharaja Surajmal, one of the rulers of Rajasthan, built the Ajahn Dam. The dam diverted water into a natural depression that gave birth to a small yet flourishing wetland, which later became the Bharatpur birth sanctuary. Initially, the sanctuary was used by the Maharaja as a duck hunting ground to entertain British officers and the royals. Thousands of ducks were hunted in a single day. After India's independence, the fate of this wetland turned. Over the years, forest officer Kailash Sankla and conservationist Dr. Salim Ali worked persistently to turn this bird slaughtering stadium into a safe haven for birds. The area was made a national park in 1982 and in 1985 Bharatpur was accepted as a world heritage site. However, from the late 20th century, Bharatpur started facing an acute shortage of water. Irregular monsoons and construction of dams on connected rivers led to droughts. Bharatpur was the only wintering home in the Indian subcontinent for the Siberian crane. But shortage of water and poaching along its migration route put a stop to the visits. The last pair was seen in 2002. To compensate for the recurring droughts, new water resources were deployed between 2007 and 2012. The park requires about 550 million cubic feet of water per year, which is currently provided via a pipeline from the Chambal River. But the struggles are far from over. This fragile ecosystem needs constant and strict monitoring from the park authorities to ensure it has a required share of water.
most of the birds travel long distances to reach Bharatpur, often crossing countries and continents. As hosts, we must ensure they feel at home and continue to return year after year. The future of this park lies in our hands. Good evening, everybody. I'm Divya, and I'll be your host for today. We keep hearing that we're losing wetlands three times faster than forests. But first, what are wetlands? Simply put, wetlands are land areas that are saturated with water, either seasonally or through the year. These could be human-made wetlands, like Bharatpur, that we just saw, or even paddy fields. It could be inland wetlands that that are like marshes and lakes, and it could be coastal wetlands like mangroves or saltwater marshes and lagoons. In fact, India has over 7 lakh wetlands, and only 75 of these are recognized as Ramsar site. A Ramsar site is, um, is a site that has been recognized as of international importance by the committee. A Ramsar site is a wetland site that is designated to be of international importance under the Ramsar Convention. While Ramsar sites are in fact afforded some protection, we have lost one third of our wetlands over the last four decades. Let's take another look at a video that gives us the exact status of India's wetlands today. Can, can I request the video be placed? Our next film takes us to Andhra Pradesh and to India's second largest mangrove forest. Here, the river Godavari forms a dense estuarine ecosystem, a Godavari mangrove. About 235 kilometers of this forest is protected as a Koringa wildlife sanctuary. And this ecologically rich region is also the lifeline for over 40 villages in the region. Can you please come? A dense mangrove forest, second largest along the east coast of India, spreads across the vast delta of the Godavari. Nearly two-thirds of these forests fall within the Koringa Wildlife Sanctuary. Straddling land and sea, this is an ecosystem of interdependence and synergy. Today, the tides rise and flood the forest floor. 
the shallow waters turn into breeding grounds for new life as juvenile fish find food and refuge. When the tide ebbs, the wet soil, rich in algae and fungi, invites a variety of creatures to the surface. Mudskippers hop out of their burrows and fiddler crabs scoop up mud for nutrients and discard sand balls, keeping the forest floor aerated. Above, the branching trees form an impenetrable mesh of hypnotic stillness. The silence is deceptive. The dense canopy holds many secrets. Predators bask in its branches, waiting for prey. The night beckons its apex predator, the elusive fishing cat. Cloaked in darkness, this mysterious hunter stalks the river's edge. The sanctuary also supports local fisherfolk, who have developed a complex communal fishing system to keep overfishing in check ensuring the marine health of the creeks. The forest department conducts conservation and restoration drives to help maintain the precious balance of Coringa's sensitive ecosystem. Like the network of roots that make the mangrove forest strong, every organism here contributes to the health of the sanctuary. I hope you enjoyed that film. I just like to elaborate on the complex system that the film refers to used by the fishing community. A small rotating set of fishermen from each village go out each day and fish. And the money from the catch is shared amongst the households in each village. Also, each where every village has a set perimeter within the creek when making fish. All of this ensures that there is no overfishing or competition in theory. But despite the protection offered to the wildlife sanctuary, Coringa is threatened by pollution due to the flow of industrial and irrigation effluent into the creek. Construction of the Polavaran Dam would also mean possible reduction in the share of water from the Godavari into the wildlife plant. This is not the story of just Kuringa. As we saw in the video, across India, wetlands are severely threatened and are steadily vanishing. Most urban wetlands are being swallowed by expanding cities, while others are treated as wastelands and drowned under toxic heat. What is a wasteland? A holdover from the colonial period. Wasteland is a term that is used to refer to uncultivated land that, is, that did not provide revenue. This was also often declared state, state property and was therefore diverted for other use. But wetlands, as we have seen, are far from wasteland. They are responsible for the health of not just one ecosystem, but also for the health of seas and lakes and, you know, referred to as the kidneys of our, um, often referred to kidneys. Take the example of our next film that transports us to Rajasthan and its city of lakes, Udaipur. Udaipur's interconnected lakes form a lake system that supports groundwater recharge and water availability for the local community. This provides water for agriculture, for drinking water, even for industry. It has also welcomed migratory birds for hundreds of years. But the health of these lakes is declining. Let's watch Udaipur's story. We're in the royal city of Udaipur, a city that has historically faced water scarcity because of its geographical location. The primary reason for its 17th century rulers to build an array of artificial lakes to ensure regular water supply. This indigenous system of interconnected lakes made Udaipur water sufficient and earned it the nickname, the City of Lakes. These lakes are the lifeline of Udaipur even today. 
They are the only source of drinking water for more than 6 lakh residents and continue to act as a sink for the city's pollutants. These lakes are also a haven for migratory and resident birds. In and around Udaipur, eight locations have been classified as important bird areas and are considered globally crucial for the conservation of birds. For some, these urban wetlands are a playground, while for others, it's a delightful buffet. These lakes are essential for the well-being of Udaipur, but are reeling under the pressures of urbanization. Lacks of tourists visit the lakes every year. With about 70 carts, more than 80 hotels and 6,000 houses located on the banks of the lakes, these wetlands are under constant threat of degradation. Dumping of garbage, temple waste, toxic chemicals and pesticides into the lakes has severely deteriorated water quality. Even the number of migratory birds visiting Udaipur has been steadily declining. While governing bodies accept the declining health of Udaipur lakes as an environmental crisis, not enough has been done to protect them. Unchecked sewage still flows into the streams directly and dumps of marble slurry continue to contaminate groundwater. Upcoming plans to bring in water sports to boost tourism could be disastrous for birds. Udaipur is just one example of how the fate of wetlands across India is hanging in the balance. The loss of wetlands needs to be seen not just as a biodiversity crisis, but as a developmental crisis, which could further intensify water, food and climate insecurity. Udaipur is blessed with a rich avian diversity, a heritage as important as the city's ancestral forts. Defending Udaipur's lakes is critical, not only for the survival of birds, but also for its humans. As you can see, the ground realities of wetlands across India are complicated and tenuous. Stories of ecological loss, especially at the alarming rate, can leave us with an overwhelming sense of despair. But there are examples of restoration of these degraded wetlands, changing the tide for both humans and the other than humans, sharing this wet, sharing this landscape. Take the instance of Minar, a bustling village that is also in the district, but has a very different story to tell. Can you hear it? दुनिया में तो सबसे अगर कोई चीज है ईश्वर की बनाई पक्षी ही हैं हम आप सभी यहां हैं तो इन पक्षियों की वजह से हैं मेरा ये जुनून है कि मैं हर दिन की इनकी एक्टिविटी दोनों टाइम की नहीं देखता हूं तो मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि आज मैं अपनी लाइफ का कुछ मिस कर गया हूं About 50 kilometers from Udaipur, a bird village tells us a unique story of hope and love. Minar is not a reserved bird area, yet its avian residents thrive alongside its humans. 
thousands of resident and migratory birds feel secure, even in the heart of a bustling village. The reason are the Minarias, the local people of Minar. These passionate bird lovers call themselves Pakshi Mitra, or friends of birds. Menar ne sadiyon se is water body ko saheja hua hai. Yahan hunting nahi hoti hai, shikar kisi prakar ka nahi hota. Khud nahi karte. Bahar ke koi log aate hai, to Menar ka itna dar hai ki wo yahan shikar kar nahi paate hai. The Pakshi Mitra have been trained on bird behavior by the forest department and given binoculars to help them protect the birds. यहाँ की जो चिड़ियाँ थी हम बचपन में जब तालाब में नहाया करते थे सारे काले काले birds नजर आते थे हमें लेकिन अब जब मैं इनको देखने लगा हूँ इनकी activities को watch करने लगा हूँ पहले हम लगता था कि पूरा तालाब बदकों से भरा हुआ है अब लगता है कि यहाँ पे बदकों में पेलिकन से फ्लेमिंगो से नॉर्दर्न शावलर है नॉर्दर्न पिन टेल है यहाँ पे कॉमन कोर्स है ग्रेड क्रेस्टेड ग्रीब है ग्रे लेग गीज है बार हेडेड गीज है तो डिफरेंट डिफरेंट नेम्स अब आते हैं उनके नाम जानते हैं उनकी चोच को देखते हैं उनके पैरों को देख के मजा आता है द विलेजर्स डू नॉट यूज वॉटर फ्रॉम द लेक्स एंड पॉन्स फॉर इरीगेशन मेंटेनिंग अ कंसिस्टेंट वॉटर लेवल थ्रू द ईयर सुबह शाम तालाब के इर्द गिर्द हम पेट्रोलिंग करते ही हैं धन तालाब है इसमें पहले खेती करते थे लेकिन जो यहाँ के बुजुर्ग हैं उन्होंने इन पक्षियों के लिए वो खेती का ठेका देना भी बंद कर दिया उससे इनकम होती थी गाँव को वो भी इनके लिए छोड़ दिया टू इंश्योर प्लेंटी ऑफ फूड फॉर द बर्ड्स द एल्डर्स ऑफ मिनार है फिशिंग इन दीज वॉटर बॉडीज फिशिंग का आज दिन तक कभी यहाँ पर ठेका नहीं दिया गया है मछलियों का कभी कोई यहाँ पर ठेका नहीं दिया गया तो पक्षियों के लिए वो बहुत ज़्यादा अच्छा है फ्रॉम टाइम टू टाइम The birds also reward the villagers for their love and friendship. पिछले साल की एक घटना है कॉमन क्रेन्स आते हैं अपने यहाँ कॉमन क्रेन का खाना क्या है आसपास के खेतों में जाएंगे चने के खेतों में और उनके वो जो शूट्स होते हैं उनको खाते हैं तो पिछले साल ये हुआ कि कॉमन क्रेन ने वो शूट्स खा लिए अब वो किसान रोने लगा यार कि मेरे चने सारे खा गए लेकिन उनके खाने से उनकी जो फुटान थी वो और ज़्यादा हो गई तो उस साल उसका प्रोडक्शन अच्छा हुआ था इस साल मुझे वो पूछ रहा था किसान यार भाई वो वो अपने क्रेन कब आ रहे इस साल द बर्ड्स ऑफ मिनार आर इट्स प्राइड एंड द मिनारियाज हैव सेट अ फाइन एग्जाम्पल फॉर देयर नेबर्स ऐसे दूसरे आसपास के गांव वालों को भी सीखने को मिल रहा है कि किस तरह से मैनार ने नाम कमाया है पक्षियों की वजह से तो वो चाहते कि हमारे यहाँ भी पक्षी आए तो अगर वो चाहेंगे पक्षी आए तो वो पानी को बचाएंगे और पानी को बचाएंगे तो निश्चित रूप से बायोडाइवर्सिटी बढ़ेगी Just a quick note: if you have any questions as we watch this film, or even otherwise, and uh, on these wetlands or what we can do to protect wetlands in general, do drop them in the chat box. We will be joined by Dr. Amit Dube from WWF India for a question and answer session after our screen. Back to Minar now. Uh, so I just wanted to add a few notes on Minar. Uh, it is now widely recognized as a bird village, and the forest department has, in fact, initiated the process of notification of Minar as a wetland. This will recognize the role of these the offing ecosystems in the storage of sediment and nutrients, and also importantly, enable the local authorities to maintain the respective nature. Not just in villages, we also have encouraging examples of collective action in cities. Our next film is one such heartwarming example. From Delhi and Pia, can we please see this? In the middle of a city of concrete and glass, is a small water body, one that bears testimony to the fact that change for better is possible 
and that every effort counts. But the place wasn't always like this. It was once a dumping ground for garbage and debris in the urban village of Sikandarpur Ghosi. Before that, it was a part of a seasonal stream that used to drain rainwater from the Aravalis. But with growing urbanization, severe degradation of the Aravali watershed and coming up of a network of roads, the stream was fragmented and blocked. And water started to collect at this low point. Over time, the water body turned into a cesspool of sewage from Sikandarpur and surrounding buildings, overrun with invasive hyacinths, phragmites and other weeds. A recent study by the Gurugram Metropolitan Development Authority or GMDA revealed that 184 water bodies in the Gurugram district are beyond revival or restoration. But luckily, this little water body had a better future waiting. All thanks to timely action by citizen groups. In early 2020, I am Gurgaon and Serge, along with the GMDA, took on the tough task of cleaning up and reviving the Sikandarpur water body. I felt that there is an opportunity to uh, reuse this water. There is an opportunity for us to create this as a collection point. It took us a few days to understand how do we move around this area. Because you could see a water body which was full of hyacinth. There was no way to reach there. And you could see pigs and you could see a lot of uh, plastic dumped around. If this project worked, the payoffs could be big. It could recharge the groundwater and improve the watershed of this severely water scarce and polluted region. But for that to happen, many challenges had to be met head on. First step was to clear encroachments. Then the surrounding area had to be cleaned out. Paths had to be laid around the water body so trucks and earth movers could access it. Tons of debris had to be dealt with. There were different shapes and sizes of construction debris and we kind of put them in different lots because some of the lot could be reused. One of the hardest exercises was removal of the invasive species that had taken over. When nothing else seemed to work, there was always good old Indian jugaad. It took us a couple of months to take that hyacinth out because you couldn't get your machines in the middle. If you take out the hyacinth, what will you do with it? Uh, we can't just dump it around. So we actually took up an area, put the hyacinth there in layers to make manure. After this, the sludge had to be dredged and taken out. And plastics had to be removed from the water body and the surroundings. I'm not just talking about small plastic, we're talking about truck loads of plastic. Then you would segregate the plastic and kind of dispose of the plastic separately. Almost everything we were trying to reuse or recycle or send it to the right place. At a nursery nearby, saplings were prepared to plant native species around the water body. Plantation drives were started in the entire area. In two months, the water body was cleared considerably. But soon work had to stop due to the pandemic. When it resumed, the place already looked dramatically transformed. Even though there's a long way to go before the full vision of the revival project comes to life, it already gives Gurugram some much needed hope. It will take us one or two years or maybe more. The biggest, biggest thing about cleaning is kind of over. It's not uh, 
finished but it's you know it's never ending because there will be so much plastic coming out uh, forever and um, the next level of plantation is starting and the third level will be the interventions to uh, create the space for public to use. When complete this project will be exemplary for Gurugram with a thriving water body, plenty of birds and vegetation endemic to the Aravalis, Sikandarpur would be a natural filter for pollutants and disease and an inclusive space for citizens to feel one with nature. It is now time for the highlight of our screening, the special premiere of our film, Rebirth of Mangla Jyoti. All of 10 square kilometers, Mangla Jyoti is a freshwater area with a diversity of habitat, including marshes, reed beds, and shallow water. Due to its sheer waterfall diversity, the wetland is now an important bird area, but this has not always been the case. So with, without much further ado, let's watch the film. These black-tailed godwits are having a feast. After all, they've traveled all the way from Iceland and Central Asia to spend their winters here and must fuel up. Thankfully, this wetland in Odisha offers a generous buffet of aquatic plants, fish, crustaceans and insects, inviting a variety of takers. Everyone seems happy with their share. Well, almost everyone. The resident egrets and herons also wait for winter when the water is shallow and fishing easier. Here, each one gets to pick a fish that matches their taste, including the locals. Nearly 4,000 people depend on this wetland named after their village, Mangala Jodi. But this paradise was once almost lost. The Mangala Jodi wetland lies on the northwestern edge of the Chilika Lagoon, India's largest wintering ground for migratory birds. Here, the wetland's fresh water meets the lagoon's salt water, creating a marshy habitat. Every winter, it welcomes more than 300,000 wetland birds. Black-tailed godwits, black-winged stilts, plovers, rails, waders and waterfowls travel thousands of kilometers to spend their winters in this marsh. Locals have hunted birds for generations here. But in the early 1990s, the situation worsened when the nearby restaurants added bird meat to their menu. The promise of better income lured the villagers. In the dead of the night, many laced the vegetation with a hazardous pesticide called furutin. At dawn, hundreds of birds fed on poisoned plants and dropped dead. Boatloads of corpses were sold in the meat markets of Odisha. The mass killings drastically reduced the number of birds. The wetland and its birds were suffering. But in 1998, Wild Orissa, a non-profit conservation organization, 
began to slowly turn the tide in Mangala Jodi. After several years of concerted efforts by conservationists, the hunters reassessed their impact on the ecosystem. Soon, many poachers joined hands with Wilderissa to form bird protection committees. The hunters turned into skilled naturalists and used their intimate knowledge of bird behavior for their protection. Tourism became an alternative source of income while fishing continued to provide sustenance. The journey was long and challenging, but the reward exceeded expectations. In just two decades, Mangala Jodi revived. Now, poaching has been eliminated and birds have returned in large numbers. The number of tourists multiply every year. Wildlife photographers and bird lovers flock to the wetland. Mangala Jodi attracted me not only because it's a very good birding area, because it has been the epitome of uh, history of conservation. Here the guides and the boatmen were previously poachers, but they are now uh, very good guides and they are actively involved in preserving the ecosystem and the birds of Mangala Jodi. The villagers of Mangala Jodi have revitalized their wetland and turned an adversity into an opportunity for themselves and for their avian friends. I hope you enjoyed that lovely film. The film is also available in Hindi and in Odia on our website. And with that, we end our film screening for today. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Amit Uday, Associate Director, Wetlands, WWF India, who is kindly joining us for the question and answer session. With over 23 years of experience in wetland conservation, Dr. Uday has been engaged in the preparation of integrated management plans for key wetlands in the country. He has been involved in the implementation of wetland restoration activities and the declaration of new Ramsar sites. Thank you for joining us today. Would you like to share a few words with our audience on wetland conservation and how they can help? Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me for this session. A very happy World Wetlands Day to all of you. And it's great to see so many people joining and celebrating the cause of wetland conservation. Uh, wetlands, as you all know, are very important part of our ecosystems. Uh, they are the most productive ecosystems uh, in the in the world, and that is why uh, these are the you know the home to the richest biodiversity. It's around forty percent of the total biodiversity of the planet uh, lives in these wetlands. So very very important uh, resources, but they are also the resources which are in greatest danger of extinction. Uh, they are being lost uh, at a rate which is three times faster than that of forest. So there is a dire need to conserve uh, the wetlands, and uh, with the you know with the efforts of people like you, people like us, I hope that we'll be able to conserve whatever wetlands that we are left. With. Thank you, thank you for that. We now throw the session open to the audience. Do ask any questions you have, and I can already see some questions coming in. We have fifteen minutes. So let's ask as many questions we have and gain insights from to do with in depth experience. Okay, so I see some already. Akshita Kaur Bhatia asks In Ahmedabad, we are currently observing sudden purge of digging out water lakes and overnight flattening and sand mining. How can we get this issue answered? As laymen, how do we go about the sudden surge of development and who's answered it? All right, so that's a very good question to start with. Uh, so the wetlands in India, uh, especially the wetlands which are outside the protected area, are uh, governed by wetland rules 2017. So these uh, 17, uh, these rules came into existence in 2017. And uh, as for the rules, every state has to have a uh, state wetland authority. Every district has to have a district wetland committee. 
So all the wetlands across our urban centers or rural centers are uh, either covered up by the district wetland committees and essentially covered by the state wetland authority. Now, as per the wetland rules, all the wetlands that are there, all the 7.5 lakh wetlands that have been mapped by ISRO have to be ground truth. And, uh, you know, an inventory of those wetlands have to be prepared. So the inventorization of the wetland would actually mean that those wetlands would come onto the records. So when those wetlands are on the records, uh, nobody will be able to encroach that and nobody will be able to, so it will become a legal entity. So that process is in place and I hope uh, the governments and the district budget committees uh, take that at a separate pace and once that is done, then I think we'll, we'll go a long way in uh, conservation. Thank you, thank you for that. I'll move on to our next question. Uh, Kishal Patel asks, why did mangrove cover in Gujarat decline in the current ISFR 2020? All right, uh, that's a tough one because I don't work on mangroves in Gujarat, but uh, so I cannot be very specific as to why uh, the wetlands in Gujarat have been lost. Uh, but uh, in general, the loss of uh, mangrove forests and mangrove wetlands is actually uh, accounted for, you know, the massive land use uh, and land cover changes in the upstream. Uh, the dams and barrages that are coming up over, uh, you know, the rivers that are feeding these mangroves, all this is actually having an impact on the ecology. And that is why many of the mangroves, which are very fragile ecosystems and are very sensitive to the changes in, uh, in the ecosystem, you know, different values. Uh, because of that, uh, probably uh, the Gujarat patterns have also fallen uh, prey to this. Perhaps, I'm not sure, but perhaps the answer is similar to Koringa, where we're having problems because of it, and because of the uh, changes in the creek and what that means. Uh, the next question is from Rinal Trivedi. Are there online resources for learning more about wetlands? Well, we have a lot of resources on our website from Dr. Train. Please do reach out uh, if you're not able to find. I think we're also adding some links here in chat. We have infographics and have explainers. Uh, Dr. Yeah, a lot of resources are available, a lot of success stories uh, on, uh, you know, wetland conservation is there on our website. And thankfully, we also have a Wetlands of India portal uh, by a Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. And that has got all the data related to the wetlands, uh, the wetland health cards, the free documents of the wetlands, number of wetlands, the interactive maps. Uh, all this information is available on the uh, wetland of India portal, so it can be downloaded. A lot of material is available on the WWF website also. Okay, so if, for example, if Akshita Kaur wanted more information about what's happening in India, she might find something on the portal. Yes, absolutely. So that's absolutely. your answer. <laughs> Uh, Ashita, if you want to find out, maybe first that would be a good starting point, and then you can explore if there's anything uh, locally happening that you can support. Shannon Olson, really love the perspective of the people embedded in these ecosystems. Thank you so much. How can we ensure that the traditional and local knowledge is combined with science for effective studies? Wow, that's a beautiful question. So uh, the wetland conservation in India uh, through MOEFCC and the knowledge partners has now been taken through uh, a four-pronged ap approach. And one of the important components of that is to have what are known as wetland mitras. And the wetland mitras are essentially the friends of rivers. They are an essential entity now in wetland conservation. And through these wetland mitras, and these wetland mitras are actually people from all walks of life. These are people who are passionate about wetland conservation. These could be students, these could be, you know, local elders, these could be people with indigenous knowledge. This could be uh, people from research organizations. This could be people from CSOs and NGOs who've been working on wetlands. So anybody and everybody who's passionate about this wetland could actually be a part of this wetland net Mitra network. So, uh, and this wetland Mitra network is actually empowered to take decisions on wetland conservation. So through this wetland Mitra network, we are actually able to uh, you know, combine science, combine the local knowledge, the indigenous knowledge, 
and that would eventually lead to effective uh, conservation and management of wetlands. Thank you, thank you. That was I did not know about. Thank you. That discovered today. I learned that. I'll move on to the next one. Neha Dara asks, is it even possible to combat something like drought? Can Dr. Dupe share any examples that can give us hope? Absolutely, absolutely. And I learn uh, that uh, most of the students, most of the participants are from Bangalore, if I'm not wrong. Yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll like to give an example of a place very close to Bangalore where we've been able to combat drought, a wetland that had been dry for 30 years now has water and it has overflown after almost 40 years. Uh, so this is a wetland in a Basheti Halli. Uh, this is a place very close to Devan Halli, Bangalore rural district. And this wetland, because of the fragmentation, is a part of the cascade. And because of the fragmentation, this wetland had lost all the water that used to come and it was fragmented uh, from its catchment. So there were water was not flowing into this wetland and was going away. And a huge population of around 2.5 lakh people were dependent on this wetland earlier for irrigation and drinking purposes. So when we intervened, we brought together the district administration, we brought together the industries that were around it, we brought together the Gram Panchayat and the local communities. They all came up with a conservation effort and uh, because of, you know, the scientific and traditional knowledge, we were able to revive this wetland uh, within one year of uh, the activities. And immediately after that, in 2019, it got full. And 2022 rains, it overflowed for the first time. So it is very much possible. You need to have uh, willingness to do that and scientific equipment to do that. That is just the most heartwarming case for Um, All right, our next one. Mega Cube Food asks, I have no idea that there are uh, over 7 lakh uh, wetlands. How can common people raise awareness? Very sad. Okay, again, I think uh, the answer is uh, the wetland metra platform. That's how common people can actually become the warriors of the wetlands. They can actually enroll themselves in this wetland metra program of MOUCC. And they can, uh, probably a group can adopt a wetland, work towards its conservation, make strategies. And uh, believe me, with the kind of uh, uh, buzz that is around wetland conservation these days, uh, you will be able to make a dent. Uh, I'm sure it will be able to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just, uh, we'll take a few more questions. I think we have about five more minutes. Oh, sure. Malaika asks, what according to you are good indicator species for the health of the world? Okay, there are beyond that. Uh, so, uh, again, MOEFCC has actually developed a card, a wetland health card which has got nine indicators under five thematics. So wetland to be healthy has to have good amount of water. It has to have a good connectivity with the catchment. It has to have a good water quality. It has to have good biodiversity and it has to have good governance. So under these indicators, uh, you know, if you talk about good indicators, then under governance, a wetland has to be mapped. There has to be a map of the wetland so we know that this is the wetland area. This is the catchment area of the wetland. So that has to de be demarcated and it has to be put in the government records, the cadastral records. Uh, the wetland has to have a management plan, how to manage a wetland. So unless we have that, you will not be able to govern the wetland effectively. So that is, those are also very important indicators. When we talk about water quality, there are a number of parameters which are indicator of a healthy wetland. But there's uh, nothing that uh, most species that you see in, like they say dragonflies are those indicators of water. No, no, there are, there are, there definitely are. So when we talk about the species, the best indicator uh, is the amount of biodiversity that a wetland holds in terms of number of species and the types of species. Uh, you know, one of the best indicators of uh, wetland health are the primary producers. Uh, those are the macrophytes in the wetland. So in general, if you see wet, uh, macrophytes, macrophytes are the higher plants, by the way, which live in wetlands. So the macrophytes, if they are, uh, you know, submerged macrophytes, so species like Naja, species like Hydrilla, 
uh, which live under the surface of the water and are rooted to the lake bottom. If you see that kind of a uh, of a macrophyte, that would indicate that the wetland is healthy. On the contrary, if you see floating macrophyte, uh, pistia, or if you see iconia, water hyacinth, for example, uh, those kind of macrophytes, if they are present, that would indicate that the water quality is bad and the wetland is not healthy. Similarly, birds could also, uh, you know, give you a uh, good idea about the health of the wetland. So, birds like stills, uh, moorhens, they talk about, you know, bad health of the ecosystem. While if you have a lot of waders, if you have, you know, cormorants, fish eating birds, that will uh, sort of show you that the wetland is healthy. Okay, thank you. Krishnamurti says, great news for Minari. Question, did the conservation of birds improve the income of species? I can answer that in part. Um, it did because they, there's a, they've, now it's a birding village. There is a lot of uh, birding tourism that comes in. There is uh, some of, a lot of it is sustainable tourism for a small number. But maybe this is a good way to elaborate on this. And uh, I can give you another example. Um, so the town of Bharatpur is entirely dependent on the income that comes out of birding. Uh, so Bharatpur has got uh, Keladev National Park and all the hotel industries, all the rickshaw pullers, all the nature guys, they all depend on this Keladev National Park for the entire economy. So yeah, if you have a healthy wetland ecosystem, if you have healthy birds, it will definitely bring a lot of uh, financial incentives uh, to the local city. Thank you. Uh, Mona Lita Panda, Panda. I'm sorry, I might be missing that. Uh, hard coded to pronounce it. Panda. <laughs> uh, I would like to ask what exactly is, what exactly revived the Mangla Jodi wetness? Just stopping poachers has brought the change, or any other measures were also taken? Did you know about that? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I've uh, not been through this. So We'll skip to the next one. Um, Akshata Pradhan, how can citizens in our individual capacities work towards the conservation of weapons? I think Dr. Dubey has elaborated that there are several resources that we can access. Uh, that there is the Friends of Web. Um, anything else? Any other resources? She's asking, how can we, in our individual capacities, work towards the conservation? I think, again, uh, if you enroll yourself as wetland mitra and work towards conservation of wetlands, I think that should suffice uh, the, the cause of wetland conservation. So, yeah. uh, Farida Tampal asks, the wetland rules do not include human-made water tanks in its purview, despite these having all the characteristics of natural wetlands. Is this uh, the case? Yeah, hi Farida. Uh, I uh, it does it, it it is the case, but uh, the wetland rules also explicitly say that the uh, you know the water bodies, which are constructed specifically for the purposes of drinking water, or uh, supply of irrigation water, does do not come under the purview. But it doesn't prevent them to be uh, conserved under wetland rules 2017. If the wetland manager is willing, they can actually. Uh, declare or notify a wetland under the wetland rules 2017. So it is entirely up to the wetland manager. It is, you know, this particular provision of the wetland rule is to give the liberty to the manager of the wetland, which has been constructed or the water body, which has been constructed for a specific purpose to be free of those clauses. So it is, it is not uh, really a hindrance in the way of uh, notification of the wetland. Uh, many of the Ramsar sites, are actually human-made wetlands, and they are notified as per the wetland rules 2017. Nothing prevents it. Oh, thank you. I have a last question here that says, um, Sanket asks, is there a method to create newer wetlands, or has it already been tried in any project, as probably restoring the ones which have been lost is sometimes impossible at certain places? Uh, there are a number of methods of creating your wetlands and in fact if you look at the wetland statistics around the world uh, the human wet med uh, wetlands are actually on a rise 
So, you know, uh, we construct wetlands for a variety of purposes, like we construct fish tanks, fish ponds, we construct salt pans. Uh, so uh, there are a number of ways of constructing uh, uh, newer wetlands. But, uh, you know, uh, a wetland uh, is, is a living entity, right? So a wetland, uh, to acquire the wetland characteristic, if you, if you, uh, you know, dig a ditch, if you create a, a water holding place, it will take a substantial amount of time to acquire the wetland characteristic and to stabilize the wetland. So better is to try and conserve and preserve the wetlands that we have, which already have had all the characteristics of the wetland rather than trying to create the new one. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's it. I said the last question, but I'm going to squeeze in the last point. Please give me this. Uh, <laughs> Sandeep asks, I need a definition of wetland that says it includes both natural and man-made water bodies. Please carry on. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is the uh, definition that has been given by the Ramsar Convention. And also the wetland rules also says that natural and man-made water bodies can actually be treated as wetlands. And as I said, many of the man-made water bodies in India also are Ramsar sites and have been notified as a wetland. In fact, one of the first wetlands to be notified in India under the wetlands of 2017, the Sukhna Lake of Chandigarh is a man-made wetland. So definitely man-made wetland, if the uh, wetland manager wants, could be notified uh, under the wetland rules. Thank you so much, Mr. Dubey. I'm sorry that we overshot by about five minutes. But, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> we couldn't stop ourselves. <laughs> no, absolutely. It, it was a pleasure for me. Thank you. I hope this session was insightful. If you're still wondering how you can get started, you have the wetland club, and you can also probably, and here's a suggestion, whether in a metro or in a small town, I'm sure all localities have wetlands, as you well know now. So take a wetlands field trip, uh, see where respiration might be needed, assess the health. Uh, now we have some tools with which we can you know, make out whether it's something that is degraded. Uh, if there is hyacinth, for example, you know that it is degraded. Find out if there are local respiration efforts that you can support. Um, again, if you're looking for resources that can build support and pick up conversation, do check out educational material that we have on our website, on Glasgow Spain. We have infographics, we have quizzes, and more. And as Dr. Dubey also pointed out, there are resources that are available in a way, in many cases. They are, you can always refer, this, this live stream will be saved, so you can refer, it, refer back to the questions if you want to revisit them. Uh, this will be available on our YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, that with that, we are closing this session. Um, Details and links, everything will be in our chat, but do feel free to reach out to us too. That brings us to an end uh, of today's event. I'd now like to invite Neha Dara to join me in thanking our partners for today once again. Thank you, Divya. You did a tremendous job. I think that was a really engaging session for all of us. And uh, thank you, everybody in the audience. Your questions were amazing. And uh, Dr. Dubey, you uh, really provided us so much insight and information. Thank you for making time for that. Uh, there are still questions that we haven't been able to get to. So I'm going to ask everybody in the audience, you can just email them to us at sustain at roundglass.com. And Dr. Dubey, we might impose on you to uh, respond to some of them so that we can get back to people. Once again, I want to thank our partners for uh, being a part of this. Uh, thank you to the Echo Network. Thank you to WWF India. We've included descriptions of them and the tremendous work they're doing in the description uh, for this event. So please look at that and engage with them as well. And feel free to share the link of today's event with any friends who couldn't be here. And once again, thank you for being an incredible audience who were so engaged and interested. Uh, it makes us feel a sense of uh, hope that it is possible to do something to protect the wetlands of India. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a good one weekend. Line. One last one. Go for it, Divya. <laughs> <laughs> we hope to do a lot more events like this. So do follow us on Instagram and YouTube for any updates. And uh, yes, thank you and have a great evening. <laughs>